This lecture will cover the development of the reproductive system. When we begin this lecture, we want to think first of all about three questions. First, what does it mean to be female? Second, what does it mean to be male? And perhaps the most difficult question to ask is number three, which is, are humans sexually dimorphic? It's an interesting question that's been raised more and more over the last 30 years, asking, are there really just males and females, or are there intermediaries? If you look at this chart, this is some current statistics on individuals who do not fit the current stereotype of an XX female or an XX XY male. Those individuals, at least genetically, occur one in every 1,600 births. For example, Kleinfelter's XXY individuals are one in 500 to 1,000 births. Androgen sensitivity syndrome, 1 in 20,000. And we can go down the list. As we do, we recognize that 1 in 5,000 births are individuals who have ambiguous genitalia. That is, at birth, one cannot tell whether they are male or female from their external phenotype. So the question remains. Number one, are we really sexually dimorphic? And two, what can we learn about this from embryology? When we talk about sex, we can talk about the genetic sex of an individual, that is, how many X's and how many Y's do they have. We can talk about gonadal sex. Do they have ovaries or do they have testes? And for a long time, that was all that could be used to determine the sex of an individual what type of gonads. In terms of the phenotypic sex, we can talk about the duct system or we can talk about the external genitalia. So basically, we can look at these three characteristics uh, to determine the sex of an individual. It gets more complicated when one en enters into the realm of things like gender identity. That is, the individual self-identification as either male or female, regardless of the above characteristics, or the gender role, that is, the behavior and beliefs that either males or females are perceived to take, and then sexual orientation, which has to do more with an individual's attraction to a particular type of uh, individual with a particular phenotype. So this all just complicates the discussion of what we mean by male and female. So let's look at the development of the reproductive system and what can that tell us about all this. First of all, early on in the 20s and early 30s, it became clear that if an individual had two X chromosomes, normally they would become female, and an X and a Y chromosome, they would become a male. However, it wasn't until much later that it became clear that it wasn't just the Y chromosome, but it was the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome, which encoded the testis-determining factor, which was important for determining the male phenotype. If that testis-determining factor is present, the male phenotype can develop. If not, an ambiguous or female phenotype develops. Regardless of whether this testis determining factor is on the Y chromosome or on the X chromosome. So as I said, in the 20s, it became apparent to scientists that males had XY chromosomes and females had XXs. But look, it was 38 years later that it became apparent that the Y was what determined maleness and the lack of a Y determined femaleness. 
So for a long time in the 50s and 60s, what individuals thought was the female phenotype was the default characteristic. We currently know that it's more than that, and we'll talk about that during the lecture. In 1966, it, became, it was found that it was the short arm of the Y chromosome that carried the testis determining factor. If we look at the Y chromosome, which we can see here, we can see that it has a short arm and a long arm. And what individuals found is if you had a complete deletion of the long arm and even some of the short arm, but the certain regions of the short arm were present, often translocated to a, an X chromosome, then even though there were two X chromosomes, the individual would demonstrate the male phenotype. Long arm deletions in and of themselves then gave uh, no deleterious effects. You had XY males that had long arm deletions that still had the male phenotype. And it became apparent in studying a group of XY individuals who were females in phenotype that what they had was a missing portion of the Y chromosome. So, in 1959, it was the Y chromosome that was important. It was further localized to the short arm of the Y chromosome, then region one of the Y chromosome in 86. And it really wasn't until 20 years ago that we knew it was, there was a sex determining region on the Y chromosome that directed the male phenotype to develop. So the primary sex determination, the Y chromosome was needed, and that is the testis determining region. And it then became apparent that a second X was needed to become female because individuals who are XO are female in phenotype, but they don't have ovarian follicles. And so they have gonadal dysgenesis and these individuals, uh, XO individuals, are individuals with Turner syndrome. And as I said, they can have a female phenotype without the development of the ovarian follicles. So the two X's, female, XY, male, it was the test that's determining region that determined that there was a sex determining region on the Y chromosome and a male phenotype developed. And what we want to do is go through how that occurred. So now we're looking at a cross section of an embryo at around the level of the upper lumbar, lower thoracic region. Here we can see the gut tube. Here we can see the neural tube. Here we can see the dorsal mesentery, paired dorsal aorta at this point, and a notochord. We talked about how the nephric tubules begin to form. And just in front of that, there becomes an area which is going to be populated by germ cells. The germ cells are going to migrate in over the dorsal mesentery. And they're going to invade the salomic epithelium that covers this region here, which is called the genital ridge on both sides. The salomic epithelium is going to invaginate and form primitive sex cords. If we take this cross section and simply make a section pretty much through this region here, if you will, and take a few artistic liberties, what we can see here is the embryo, the head here, the tail here. You can see the gut tube forming here, the hind gut here. We can see the mesonephric uh, kidney here in pink with the blue mesonephric duct. And we can see another duct that's going to form. It's going to form lateral to the, uh, the uh, developing indifferent gonad. And that's going to be the paramesonephric duct. That's in purple. And then we can see the 
genital ridge developing into the indifferent gonad. This gonad is neither male nor female at this point, it's indifferent. So this is what we're looking at very early on in development, up to about the sixth week of development, eight weeks uh, LMP. And this is a very nice picture from Dr. Kathy Sulik's website uh, in North Carolina, in which she shows now the migration of these cells, primordial germ cells, into the genital ridge. Again, there's your developing nervous system. There is your developing aorta on either side. Uh, and so what we're seeing is the development then of these gonadal ridges. So let's talk about the genetics a little bit. Genetic males are going to have the testis determining factor on it, which has the sex determining region of the Y chromosome. Okay, so if the Y chromosome has the sex determining region, which has the testis determining factor, then what happens is the SRY is going to upregulate steroidogenesis factor 1. And that's going to act through SOX9 in the sexuary, uh, sex, sex cords, the primary sex cords. And what they're going to do, what's going to happen here is the medullary sex cords are going to differentiate, not the cortical ones, but the medullary ones. And when they differentiate, one of the cell types they'll di differentiate into is Sertoli cells. If an individual does not have the SRY gene, then what happens is the cortical sex cords will differentiate, and they'll differentiate into oogonia and follicular cells. This will then be the beginning of the development of the female phenotype. In the Sertoli cells, they will start to produce a factor called anti-Mullerian hormone. Anti-Mullerian hormone is going to inhibit the development of the paramesonephric ducts. Another name for the paramesonephric ducts is Mullerian ducts. In an individual without Sertoli cells, no anti-Mullerian hormone is produced, and since there's no anti-Mullerian hormone, the Mullerian ducts or the paramesonephric ducts will develop. Here we're just looking in a little more detail at some of the factors that are important in development of the male or female phenotype. Early on, the Wilms tumor gene and steroidogenesis factor genes are important to take the urogenital ridge and develop it into a gonad. Then, a series of other genes are important to help differentiate that gonad, which is early on by potential, to become either an ovary or a testis. In addition, things like human chorionic gonadotropin are going to be important in allowing the testis to develop not only Sertoli cells, but Leydig cells. And Leydig cells are going to go ahead and start producing testosterone, which can be converted to dihydrotestosterone. So what we can see are there are factors that take the genital ridge to a bipotential gonad, and then if steroidal gen uh, it's a sex determining region of the Y chromosome is present, and SOX9 is present, then that gonad will become the testis. And if DAX1 is present and WENT4, that gonad becomes an ovary. And this continues as the differentiation proceeds, and we don't know all the steps in these differentiation cascades. For example, in the male, we do know that steroidogenesis factor 1 is important to continue this development. And in addition to that, we can see it's very, very complex in terms of the testis development because it's not just the Wilms tumor gene, but others that influence the uh, sex determining regions of the Y chromosome, SRY, to be expressed. 
SRY plays a role on SOX9, but does so along with DAX1 and FGF9. These then influence the development of Sertoli cells, as we said, and the Sertoli cells with SOX9, again the Wilms tumor gene, and GATA4 and steroidogenesis factor 1 are all going to allow for the production of anti-Mullerian hormone so that the paramezonephric ducts are going to degenerate. In addition, other factors are going to be interacting with receptors on lytic cells and they along with steroidogenesis factor 1 are going to promote lytic cells to produce testosterone. You can see there's also a CG from the placenta is important. So you can see that this is a very complex set of uh, events that takes place and we're not even sure what SRY does and how it's influenced uh, and what that influence is on SOX9. So all these steps really were just at the beginning of understanding. We know in terms of ovary development that the WNT gene is necessary uh, it gets downregulated in males and upregulated in the ovary. DAX1 then is upregulated as well, and that has a role in ovarian development. We know a lot less about the development of the ovary than we know about the development of the testis. And so there's a lot of work being done now to begin to understand those factors which regulate ovarian development. But as you can see, there is a bipotential gonad, and then under the influence of different factors, it can become either male or female, that gonad. And then again, these factors are going to further allow for the differentiation of the gonad into an ovary or into a testis. This table summarizes some of the things that we know right now. For example, steroidogenesis factor 1 and the Wilms tumor gene are both important for gonad development. They're transcription factors found on chromosome 9 and 11, and they're important in gonad development. Without the Wilms tumor gene, not only is gonadal development arrested, but kidney development does not occur. In terms of steroidogenesis factor 1, that not only affects the development of the gonads, but the development of the adrenal glands. We've already talked about SRY being on the Y chromosome and being a transcription factor. It's important in testis determining, uh, determination. DAX1 is on the YX chromosome and it's going to be important in ovarian formation and possibly as a repressor of testis development. SOX9 is on chromosome 17. Again, it's a transcription factor. It is going to possibly inhibit DAX1. So this may be the role of SOX9. Again, you can see the number of chromosomes involved in the development of the gonads. In addition, the Mullerian inhibiting substance or anti-Mullerian hormone, or it's also called uh, as I said, Mullerian inhibiting substance, MIS, which then uh, causes the degeneration of the paramesonephric ducts. It's found on chromosome 19, and it's a growth factor, along with WENT4, which then permits not only development of the ovary, but the paramesonephric duct. So let's go back to the indifferent gonad where we see the sex cords surrounding the germ cells and they'll become ovarian follicles if the female phenotype is going to form and Sertoli cells uh, in seminiferous tubules if the male is going to develop. Of course without sex cords, that is without that salomic epithelium, the germ cells won't mature and without germ cells there are no sex cords. So there is reciprocal interaction between these structures. So here we're just looking at that uh, ridge then, uh, genital ridge, and we can see the 
cortical sex cords and the medullary sex cords. And this is going to occur right up until six weeks, and then they'll begin to differentiate differently in males and females. So at the end of the sixth week, we're at the end of the indifferent stage. Up until now, you can't tell male from female. They're both cortical and medullary sex cords. Germ cells are present, but you can't tell whether they're uh, male or female, eggs or sperm. Generating cells. And there's paramesonephric ducts and mesonephric ducts present. And it's at this point that the male and female phenotype will diverge, given the appropriate factors being present. So here's the indifferent stage looked at in two different cartoon forms. There's the gonad developing, there's the paramesonephric duct, and the mesonephric duct. If we were to look at these from the front, we would see the gonad in green, the mesonephric duct in blue, paramesonephric duct in pink. The paramesonephric duct is going to reach the urogenital sinus where it will fuse if it develops. The mesonephric duct is going to reach the back of the urogenital sinus if it develops. So let's go on. In terms of the anti-Mullerian hormone, we said that it not only causes the degeneration of the paramesonephric ducts in the male, but also causes the cells in the gonadal ridge to become lytic cells, which will produce testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Without anti-Mullerian hormone, the paramesonephric ducts persist, and DAX1 is going to downregulate steroidal genesis factor 1, and WENT4 is going to contribute to that differentiation. So, we will form either a testis or an ovary. Here you can see the ovary with the cortical sex cord now developing here, the, the oocytes and primordial germ cells surrounded by follicular cells. Here we see the seminiferous tubules and lytic cells surrounding those tubules. So what happens? In terms of the duct system, now we're following what happens in those individuals with testis and ovaries. What you're going to have is a differential development of the ducts depending on whether there is a male or female phenotype. As we said, we have paramesonephric ducts that will fuse behind the urogenital sinus. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We're going to have the mesonephric ducts and the gonad. In terms of secondary sex determination, that is the body phenotype, the duct system, if the hormones are present, such as anti-Mullerian hormone and testosterone, then the male phenotype will develop. Depending when these are present, we can get the differentiation of the indifferent stage into the male phenotype. If these are not present, then the male structures will not develop. And without the hormones, an ambiguous phenotype appears, which may look female. Testosterone is going to induce the male genital duct system, and it's going to cause the duct system to develop from the mesonephric duct. It's going to also induce some changes in the brain. And at puberty, it causes the seminiferous tubules to canalize and mature and produce sperm. It's going to induce changes in the primary and sex secondary sexual characteristics as well at puberty. So here we are at week six. Here we are with the indifferent stage, both ducts and the gonad. What happens in the male? The male, with anti-Mullerian hormone, paramesonephric ducts degenerate. And by eight weeks, we're going to have a mesonephric duct developing into a vas deferens and epididymis, jaculatory ducts, seminal vesicles, as we can see here. The gonad then is a testis. 
this is a sagittal view which is just making the same point that initially we have both sets of ducts, the pink paramesonephric ducts and the blue mesonephric ducts and if a male is going to develop then what happens is the mesonephric ducts will continue to develop and will come in contact with the pelvic urethra uh, and so the back of the UG sinus is going to develop then and we will have the pelvic portion of the UG sinus becoming the urethra the mesonephric duct becoming the ejaculatory duct the seminal vesicles and the vas deferens and the epididymis the vas deferens is pictured here in blue and you can see the seminal vesicles developing from that the urogenital sinus is giving rise to the urethra and it will also give rise to the prostate as long as dihydrotestosterone is produced so the prostate is produced by the uh, expression uh, and production of dihydrotestosterone testosterone allows for the development of the mesonephric duct in females, estrogen is secreted from the ovaries, and it's estrogen that's important for the development of the paramesonephric ducts into the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the cervix, along with the upper third of the vagina. So in terms of the duct system, here we can see the indifferent stage, and over the course of the next four weeks, what's going to happen is the mesonephric ducts are not going to develop, and they're not going to develop because there's no testosterone and the paramesonephric ducts are going to develop because there was no anti-mullerian hormone they're going to fuse just behind the urogenital sinus if we look at this in sort of a cross section or excuse me sagittal section from the side this is what we would see so there's the paramesonephric ducts you see them fusing and you see them coming to the back of the urogenital sinus. In that region, the urogenital sinus will begin to differentiate, as will the paramesonephric ducts. And the paramesonephric ducts are going to form the uterine tubes, the uterus, the cervix, and the upper third of the vagina, with the lower part of the vagina being formed by the urogenital sinus. If we look at that in more detail on the next slide, here you can see the paramesonephric ducts coming in. They're going to form a thickening as they come in contact with that pelvic urethra. All right, and so the posterior, this is going to thicken here. This paramesonephric duct is a fused, and this will thicken in this region, this pelvic urethra, and become the sinovaginal bulbs. Then, the paramesonephric ducts, as we say, are going to fuse. And once they fuse, a canal will form. And that's going to be called the genital or uterovaginal canal. The sinusal tubercle is going to uh, develop from the sinovaginal bulbs. And that's going to thicken as well. Then, the lower part of the uterovaginal canal is going to become the vagina. Above that you're going to have the cervix and then the uterus and then the uterine tubes. The sinovaginal bulbs become the vaginal plate which is going to elongate and a canal is going to form and this will part form the lower part of the vagina. And the region in between the sinovaginal bulb the thickened from the UG sinus which is here is going to remain and that will be the hymen and the remaining uh, UG sinus here is going to be the bulb excuse me the vestibule of the vagina finally we can look at the development of the external genitalia and this is what they would look like at about the fifth week there is a glands there are urethral folds 
there's a urethral groove and there are labial scrotal swellings. And this in different stage lasts until about 12 weeks or the end of the first trimester and then differentiation of the external genitalia will begin. Dihydrotestosterone, if expressed, causes the external genitalia to become masculinized. It'll also induce the development of the prostate from the uh, pelvic urethra. So in the male, with the presence of dihydrotestosterone, the genital tubercle of the glands will form the glands in part of the shaft of the penis. The definitive UG sinus is going to form the penile urethra. The urethral folds are going to form the penis, and the labial scrotal folds are going to form the scrotum. In the absence of the dihydrotestosterone, the glands and shaft of the clitoris develop from the genital tubercle. The definitive UG sinus gives rise to the vestibule of the vagina. The urethral folds give rise to labia minora, and the labial scrotal folds give rise to labia majora. So, in the male, you can see then that the gland genital tubercle is going to elongate under dihydrotestosterone. The urethral folds are going to come together. They're going to cover the urethral groove and eventually fuse. And they'll develop into the shaft of the penis along with some of the uh, genital tubercle. In addition, the labial scrotal swellings will fuse and become the scrotum. And so we can see that development that occurs at this point in the male. So the genital tubercle is going to elongate and become the phallus. The urethral folds are going to elongate. They're going to cover the urethral groove. The urethral groove is lined by endoderm and that forms a urethral plate originally. As you go further out the uh, shaft of the penis, the urethral folds are going to meet up with an invagination of ectoderm that will become the uh, most distal part of the male urethra. Uh, in the female, the genital tubercle is going to form the clitoris. The urethral groove is not going to fuse, but rather the urethral folds are going to remain unfused and they will become the labia minora. Notice this is not correct. This should be minora. In addition, the labial scrotal swellings are not going to fuse and they will become the labia majora. Again, please note that's incorrectly labeled. You will then have a vaginal orifice and a urethral orifice. In terms of sexual differentiation then, the phenotype of phenotypic sexual development occurs over the first two or three months of preg pregnancy, but it continues well through pregnancy and beyond. Sexual differentiation of the brain occurs over the last half of pregnancy, and we really don't know a lot about the factors that allow for the sexual differentiation of the brain. Uh, we know that in terms of prenatal sexual differentiation uh, that there are genetic factors that are important. There's things like sex-linked imprinting, hormones, chemicals, immune responses, and then societal factors and how all these come together to allow for the sexual di differentiation of the brain and behavior is poorly understood at this point.